Good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to uh, Symposium C on sublethal effects of manufactured nanoparticles on uh, the brain uh, and behavior. Uh, my name's uh, Richard Handy. Uh, I'm from the University of Plymouth, uh, and I'm the director of the Ecotoxicology Research and Innovation Center at the university, where we are doing some work on uh, the neurological effects of, of nanomaterials and, and the effects on, on animal behavior as well. And um, some of the data that we're going to show you today that, that will hopefully stimulate discussions on this general topic um, come from some national funding that we've had from the Natural Environment Research Council in the UK uh, and one or two others. Um, so, so that's me. Uh, and also I'd like to introduce my co-chair, Dr. David Boyle from Plymouth. Yep, my name's uh, David Ball. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow employed on the Natural Environment Research Council um, grant that, that Richard received, um, looking at effects uh, of manufactured nanoparticles on brain behaviour and bioenergetics of, of fish in particular. Um, but although many of the examples we're going to give today are going to be about fish, it's, it's hopefully um, to stimulate a wider discussion as to whether we think these effects are relevant to. Um, uh, other animals, including humans. Um, so I guess if we go over to Richard now to start the presentations. Okay, uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, what I'd like to do first of all, because of the broad audience of, of Nano Impact Net, just say a couple of things about the, the structure and function of the nervous system so we can tune in a bit to, to this topic area. And um, uh, I guess that the first point to make is, is that we're probably more familiar with mammalian nervous systems where we have a, a central nervous system made up of a, a brain and a spinal cord with uh, sensory nerves coming in, usually to the brain and, and the upper part of the spinal cord, uh, and also uh, a motor system of nerves that control our muscles and all the uh, automatic functions that go on in our body. Uh, and those automatic functions are, are controlled by what we call the autonomic nervous system. So these are things like respiration, uh, the movements of your gut and so on, those sorts of things. And of course, uh, anatomically, we're, we're probably more familiar with these sorts of images of, of human anatomy, uh, where, where we, you know, there's, there's the brain and spinal cord, the central nervous system, we've got these peripheral nerves running off. Um, but I think it's worth remembering that uh, humans are actually quite special organisms and, and uh, our anatomy is, is, is quite different from many others. Why are we concerned about uh, neurotoxicity and, and the effects on the nervous system? Well, um, certainly one of the uh, main concerns is, is the fact that we have this autonomic nervous system that controls all of our vital functions, all these involuntary things. So the movements of our lungs, our heart rate, uh, digestive system, renal function, and so on. I think you'll all agree that these are vital uh, functions. And uh, so if we get damage to this autonomic nervous system, then, then you know, the control of those vital functions becomes compromised. And, and that's one of the main concerns uh, in, in neurotoxicology. We've known for a long time that though, uh, that the different parts of the autonomic nervous system are, uh, are anatomically different, so we have sympathetic uh, and parasympathetic pathways. And uh, uh, as well as anatomical differences in the lengths of the uh, nerves in those pathways, there are also some chemical differences. So when we're thinking about toxicology of chemicals, we also need to ask ourselves, whereabouts exactly in the nervous system are those chemicals going? What sort of uh, chemical environment is in the synapses? Are they uh, cholinergic nerves or is it another type of nerve? What, what chemistry are we going to see in that particular part of the nervous system? So we need to think that the nervous system has got different chemistries in different places. And um, we also need to think about uh, the, the nervous system as a communication network. You know, one of the prime functions of our nervous system is to coordinate all of those bodily functions. You know, all of this is going on all of the time. So we need to think about it as a coordination network. And remember that this is only one of the coordinating networks in our body. We've also got the endocrine system that does that. Uh, and many physiologists also agree that the immune system is an important communication system in the body as well. So this is one of several networks. <coughs> 
And um, within those networks, we have reflex arcs. So uh, some of these things don't require information to go through the brain. They can just be controlled at the level of spinal cord. Uh, and, and there's an example of a, uh, a typical reflex arc uh, in, in the spine. So these are uh, some automatic functions. But in the end, uh, when we're thinking about uh, integration in the nervous system, uh, we're thinking about it as a biological control system. And uh, there's a couple of points I'd like to make about that control system. First of all, uh, in, in vertebrate animals at least, our control center that seems to be managing all of that is our brain, and in particular the inner parts of the brain. Um, but in most biological control, we're, we're working to a set point. You know, our body temperature is at 37 degrees C, our blood sugar a few millimoles, and so on. Uh, and this network of control has to manage increases and decreases below the set point. And uh, part of our work at Plymouth is to, is to understand this sort of control system in a computational, uh, in silico uh, uh, neural network. Uh, and we're also looking at that from the viewpoint of uh, systems biology and toxicogenomics. Uh, but, but it is a control system. And when we're looking at toxic chemicals, we're looking at deviations above and below our physiological set points and what the nervous system is doing to control that. So finally, uh, in way of uh, anatomy, to draw you away from human anatomy now to other animals, uh, and of course we recognize that uh, certainly our brain is very special, that we've got a very large forebrain, uh, uh, and if we go through the vertebrate uh, uh, groups uh, to fishes at the top here, amphibians and birds, uh, what we can see is that the, that forebrain is actually quite small in those lower vertebrates, and other parts of the brain are more important. Uh, and so the, 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 the hind parts of the brain, and the brain and the medulla, are involved in things like control and coordination of motor functions. Um, so, so we need to, to recognize these species differences when we're looking at toxicology, and, and especially in relation to the species, uh, jumping the species barrier, extrapolating animal data to humans. And uh, of course, some animals don't have brains in the way that we might imagine. There are lots of invertebrates out there that have uh, clusters of, of, of nerves uh, which we are grouped into ganglia, that, 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 especially in segmented organisms like crayfishes and, and earthworms and so on, and some very simple organisms that just have nerve nets where there, there isn't really any particular clustering point of, of a group of neurons. So when we're looking at this from a, an environmental side, we're not just considering the, the classic central nervous system in the viewpoint of humans, but also how do we protect the nervous systems of all of these other animals as well. And one final point about function is uh, very often, you know, in classic neuroscience, we, we consider the nerve cell to be the basic unit of function of the nervous system. Uh, and of course, we've got in our minds uh, the mammalian nerve uh, with, with this long axon and this myelination that, that gives insulation on the nerve. Lots of uh, different animals don't necessarily have this type of nerve cell morphology. Uh, and of course, the, the basis of the communication are are things like action potentials traveling down the nerve and, and passing on that communication electric, electrically. Um, so, so I hope that, that's tuned you in to, 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 to anatomy and function of the nervous system. Um, so now let's talk very briefly about uh, the concerns for nanomaterials to, to give you a bit of background information for this uh, discussion. And um, uh, I'm gonna just say a couple of things about mechanisms of neurotoxicity. First of all, we can have direct interference of toxic substances with the nerves. So we can imagine, for example, uh, that trace metals will uh, block or interfere with voltage-gated ion channels in, in nerves. Uh, we know that agrochemicals like pesticides, for example, can change uh, levels of neurotransmitters in, uh, in, in the synapses of nerves. And like other cells in the body, um, oxid oxidizing chemicals can produce oxidative damage uh, in, in nerves as well. So we've got some fairly familiar mechanisms of toxicity that we know about from many chemicals. Um, but also draw your attention that the nervous system isn't just made up of nerve cells. There are lots of other supporting cells that have important functions. Uh, we, we've got uh, collections of different types of glial cells uh, and one particular cell of, of, of great interest in, in uh, toxicology uh, are the astrocytes in the nervous system. And these have some housekeeping functions. Uh, they, they control acid-base balance. Uh, 
Uh, they manage nutrients. Uh, they remove debris from the nervous system. So, so these provide a, a nice, healthy environment for those uh, uh, big uh, nerves with axons to, to operate in. Uh, and uh, yeah, here's another image showing the, the, the insulating role of, of glial cells as well. So when we're looking at neurotoxicity, we mustn't forget there are lots of other cell types in the nervous system. And, um, and one thing that we're, we're probably all familiar with is the sensitivity of, of things like the brain to, to oxygen deprivation. And, uh, uh, and one area of concern for traditional chemicals is indirect toxicity through hypoxia and, and free radical generation. So what about our concerns for nano? Well, my first question really is, do any of these traditional mechanisms of toxicity that we know about for other chemicals, do any of those apply to nanomaterials? Uh, and we can have that discussion in a moment. Um, there are some very specific things that we might raise. So for example, we know that carbon nanotubes have uh, uh, very high conductance, low resistance. Uh, and one of the concerns in neuroscience is that, you know, uh, are they able to short circuit electrical properties in nerves, for example? Um, so we need to think about those sorts of problems. Uh, and of course, the risk assessors in the audience will be worried about linking exposure and effect in, for, for their hazard assessments and risk assessments. So we need to think about the brain as a target organ, uptake across the blood-brain barrier, uh, uh, and so on. And uh, we also need to recognize how we collect data of this kind. Nearly all of our data is, is in vitro, in uh, mammalian in vitro systems, or, or some in vivo studies on, on uh, mammals and, and very often lower vertebrates. And, and how do we ch extrapolate that kind of data to, to humans? Um, well, what's the evidence that we're starting to see neurotoxic effects? I think if you go into the literature, you, you'll start to, to find papers. Uh, and here's just a few examples showing uh, uh, changes in uh, electrical properties, uh, changes in sodium current in particular pathways in the nerves, picking up on the uh, hypoxia issue and so on. So that, that data is starting to emerge. And um, uh, I just thought I'd show you a couple of little bits of, of data on, on, on some of these issues. Uh, so we've, uh, one of the things we've asked in Plymouth is, um, will nanomaterials alter the action potentials of nerves? And, and one of the things that we use is the, uh, the, the classic uh, uh, invertebrate nerve preparation. Uh, we've been using shore crabs for this, but it's, um, it's basically the, uh, uh, the, the same experiment that Huxley and others did back in 1947, I think it was, for the Nobel Prize on the action potential. So one of my students has had the pleasure of doing this. <laughs> and, um, uh, but when we do these kind of experiments, so obviously we, we characterize the materials and we're, we're not going to talk about that chemistry now, but to draw your attention to the neuroscience, one of the things that we found with the, uh, most of our nerve preparations, this is uh, a, a nerve fiber bundle from, from, from the, the crabs we were using, uh, and what you can see are these little uh, aggregates of material on, on the surface of the nerves after a few minutes. So we can see very readily down the microscope that in a, a, a neurological, physiological saline, if you like, that, that nanomaterials are precipitating quite rapidly onto the nerves. Uh, uh, and of course, in these animals, they're, they're unmyelinated nerves, so the, the material is having direct access to the, to, the, uh, to the nerves themselves. And um, so when we do single action potential recordings, uh, in this scenario here, this is a control, uh, another control, and another control using saline throughout. Here's one where we've got a control first, then our, our silver nanoparticles, then the control, and lots of different materials tested. And the take home message is nothing happened the nerve seems to be functioning normally with a bunch of different uh, uh, materials. Um, but that isn't much work for a nerve. You, nerves usually fire in high frequency trains. Um, so if we overstimulate the nerve and, and uh, try to get it to fire at high frequency and go to tetanus, uh, and here's a, a, a high frequency stimulation train here with our particles present and then back into control saline, uh, when we do this kind of thing and make the nerve work really hard, we get essentially the same results, that there are no uh, you know, re real effects on the electrical properties of the nerves. So from this kind of data, there's a feeling that maybe the electrical properties of individual nerves, at least, might, might still be uh, functional. Um, but what about brain injury? Of course, the brain's a much more complex network of, of materials. And um, we know a lot about this topic from, from looking at traditional chemicals. 
Here's uh, a bit of data from, from our lab from, from years ago showing vacuole formation, uh, fluid shifts and edema in, in brain tissue with, with copper sulfate exposure. And this is a, a trout study. We see the same thing in humans if they're uh, during copper toxicosis. So, so these sorts of injuries are, are reasonably well known. And uh, we can ask the question, do we see injuries with nanomaterials? Uh, here's an example of uh, uh, some changes in vasculature on the surface of the brain uh, following a carbon nanotube exposure in trout. And we, we've done this several times now. And uh, the, the feeling is that there are some changes in blood flow in the brain that might present a risk of vascular injury, uh, stroke-like injury in, in, in the brain in some of these animal models. Um, if we look at uh, individual sort of pathologies and individual nerves in different places, um, uh, uh, I'll just show you some, some examples from our trout work on the forebrain, um, and we can show individual uh, um, you know, necrotic nerves, uh, nerves that are, are, are showing abnormal morphology. Um, so these are scattered you know, uh, around the, nervous, uh, the central nervous system. Uh, and when we look at the thicknesses of the different layers in the nerves, this is the optic lobe. Um, if we measure these things, we can see subtle changes in the, in the thickness of those layers over time. And what's interesting, of course, is that um, uh, that, that, that can be uh, informative of, of uh, the, the stress in particular groups of neurons. And this is a, a, a representation of that data. So this is the dura on the surface of the brain down here. This is the innermost layer, the, the periventricular layer. And, uh, and what we found in some of our trout studies is that this, this layer seems to be getting a, a little bit thicker than some of the others. There's a bit of inflammation in that layer. Now, in many brain uh, structures, invertebrate animals, uh, that layer's in contact with the ventricular space. So I'm worried about fluid shifts into the ventricle and, and putting stress on that, those, those tissue layers around the ventricle. Uh, and we can see blood vessel abnormalities with, with other materials like nanocopper as well as with carbon nanotubes and individual necrotic nerves. Uh, and we can also produce these sorts of observations with dietary exposure. So um, overall, what we're seeing in our work is that there are some subtle pathologies there. They're not massive pathologies that would stop the brain from functioning, but we're concerned that, there are, you know, that if we accumulate these over long periods of time, then maybe there, there's an issue. And if we look in the rodent literature, um, people have published bits of data. That there's some vacuoles here in, in a brain slice from a, uh, a single infusion study in, in, in rodents, for example. So, so this is in more than one species. Uh, and, and just to draw your attention to, to linking to what Dave's going to tell you about in a moment, um, I can't emphasize enough uh, the importance of uh, hypoxia in the central nervous system. Uh, and, and that's a big concern in neurotoxicology. Uh, and of course, that we know that nanomaterials are respiratory toxicants. We show that in aquatic species here. You've heard lots already about respiratory exposure in, in mammalian models at, at this conference and other nano uh, meetings. Uh, and we, we see uh, respiratory pathology in the gill tissue here. And of course, you know about those respiratory injuries in, in humans as well. Um, so there is that concern. And uh, so to give you a few, few take-home messages from the, the, you know, my thoughts on this topic, uh, I think that there's a growing body of literature that there are some emerging biological effects that we need to, to have a discussion about. Uh, some of the crab nerve work and other nerve work is showing that we, we can generate action potentials in the presence of, of nanomaterials, uh, but we need to think about precipitation and agglomeration of nanomaterials in the nervous system because it is a saline-rich environment. Uh, we can find individual cells with p particular injuries like necrosis and so on, uh, but not widespread damaging pathologies across the entire brain. Uh, and, and one of the questions that we might discuss today is, you know, have we seen these pathologies before with other chemicals? Or is anything new here that's nano-specific? Uh, and, and, and we can talk about vascular injury as well. Uh, and, and please remember that nerves are not the only cells in the nervous system, that we've got all these supporting cells with, with housekeeping functions. Uh, so, so with that, uh, I'm going to ask you to, to hold questions until the discussion. I'm going to hand over to Dave. But I couldn't resist from, from showing you this uh, Larson cartoon on, 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 on the brain. Um, Dave, so I'm going to hand over to, to Dave.